I'm just going to sleep in a few hours, I think. Uh, and now this is the second attempt of my um, book clubs, the reading, which I have um, already posted my first uh, chapter reading of Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility. Today I will go to the second chapter. I will try to finish it. Let's see what happened, okay? So, let's start. Mrs. John Dashwood now installed herself mistress of Norland, and her mother and sister-in-law were degraded to the condition of visitors. As such, however, they were treated by her quite civility and by her husband with as much kindness as he could feel towards anybody beyond himself, as his wife and their child. He really pressed them with some earnestness to consider Norland as their home, and as no plan appeared so eligible to Mrs. Dashwood as remaining there till she could accommodate herself with a house in the neighborhood. His invitation was accepted. A continuance in a place where everything reminded her of former delight was exactly what suited her mind. In seasons, of cheerfulness, no temper could be more cheerful than hers or poses in a greater degree. That sanguine expectation of happiness, which is happiness itself, but in sorrow she must be equally carried away by her fancy and as far beyond consolation as in pleasure she was beyond alloy. Mrs. Dasher did, did not at all approve of what her husband intended to do for his sisters. To take three thousand pounds from their fortune of their dear little boy would be improvising. Sorry. Impoverishing. <laughs> Impoverishing him. To the most dreadful degree, she begged him to think again on that subject. How could he answer it to himself to rob his child and his ch only child too of so large a sum? And what possible claim could Miss Dashwood, who were related to him, only by half-blood, which she considered as no relationship at all, have on his generosity to some large an amount. It was very well known that no affection was ever supposed to exist between the children of any man by different marriages, and why was he to ruin himself and their poor little Harry by giving away all his money to his half-sisters? It was my father's last request to me, replied her husband, that I should assist his widow and daughters. He did not know what he was talking of, I dare say. Ten to one, but he was light-headed at the time. Had he been in his right sense, he could not have thought of such a thing as begging you to give away half your fortune from your own child. That was really something. He did not stipulate for any particular sum, my dear Fanny. He only requested me, in general terms, to assist them and make their situation more comfortable than it was in his power to do. Perhaps it would have been as well if he had left it wholly to him myself. He could hardly suppose I should neglect them, but 
as he required the promise, I could not do less than give it. At least I thought so at the time. The promise, therefore, was given and must be performed. Something must be done for them whenever they leave Norland and settle in a new home. Well, then, let something be done for them, but that something need not to be three thousand pounds. Consider, she added, that when the money is once parted with it, never can return. Your sister will marry and it will be gone forever. If indeed it could ever be restored, to our poor little boy. Why, to be sure, said her husband very gravely, that would make a great difference. The time may come when Harry will regret that so large a sum was parted with if he should have a numerous family. For instance, it would be a very convenient addition. To be sure, it would. Perhaps then it would be better for all parties if the sum were diminished one half, 500 pounds would be a prodigious, prodigious, yes, I'm, I'm correct in pronunciation, <laughs> increase to their fortunes. Oh, beyond anything great, what brother on earth would do half so much for his sisters, even if really his sisters? And as it is only half blood, but you have such a generous spirit. I would not wish to do anything mean, he replied. One had rather on such occasions do too much too little. No one, at least, can think I have not done enough for them, even themselves. They can hardly expect more. There is no knowing what they may expect, said the lady, but we are not to think of their expectations. The question is what you can afford to do. Certainly. And I think I may afford to give them five hundred pounds apiece. As it is without any addition of mine, they will each have above three thousand pounds on their mother's death. A very comfortable fortune for any young woman. To be sure it is. And indeed, it strikes me that they can want no addition at all. They will have uh, uh, 10,000 pounds divided among them. If they marry, they will be sure of doing well. And if they do not, they may all live very comfortably together on the interest of 10,000 pounds. That is very true. And therefore, I do not know whether... Upon the whole, it would not be more advisable to do something for their mother while she lives rather than for them. Something of the annuity kind, I mean. My sister should feel the good effects of it as well as herself. A hundred a year would make them all perfectly comfortable. His wife hesitated a little. However, in giving her consent to this plan. I mean, they are not still happy. Anyway, to be sure, said she, it is better than parting with 1,500 pounds at once. But then, if Mrs. Dashard should leave 15 years, we shall be completely taken in. Fifteen years, my dear Fanny, our life cannot be old half but purchase. Certainly not. But if you observe, people always live forever when there is any annuity to be paid them. 
and she is very stout and healthy and hardly 40. An annuity is a very serious business. It comes over and over every year and there is no getting rid of it. You are not aware of what you are doing. I have known a great deal of the trouble of annuities. For my mother was clocked with the payment of three to old superannuated servants by my father's will and it is amazing how disagreeable she found it. Twice every year these annuities were to be paid and there was the trouble of getting it to them and then one of them was said to have died and afterwards it turned out to be no such thing. My mother was quite sick of it. Her income was not her own, she said, with such perpetual claims on it. And it was the more unkind in my father because otherwise the money would have been entirely at my mother's disposal without any restriction whatsoever. It has given me such an abhorrence of annuities that I'm sure I would not pin myself down to the payment of one for all the world. It is certainly an unpleasant thing, replied Mr. Dasher. To have those kind of yearly drains on one's income, one's fortune, as your mother justly says, is not one's own. To be tied down to the regular payment of such a sum on every rent day is by no means desirable. It takes away one's independence, undoubtedly. And after all, you have no thanks for that. They think themselves secure. You do no, you do no more than what is expected. And it raises no gratuity at all. If I were you, whatever I did should be done at my own discretion entirely. I would not bind myself to allow them anything yearly. I may be very inconvenient some years to spare a hundred or even fifty pounds from our own expenses. I believe you are right, my love. It will be better that there should be no annuity in the case. Whatever I may give them occasionally will be of far greater assistance than a yearly allowance because they would only enlarge their style of living if they felt sure of a large income and would not be sixpence the richer for it at the end of the year it will be entirely be much the best way a present of 50 pounds now and then will prevent their ever being distressed for money and will i think be amply discharging my promise to my father i mean um at this point i have to say something the father left them three thousand pounds each for the daughters and uh, for uh, his wife one thousand pounds. But the son still feel that's inconvenient to give them the money in um, at once. Okay, that's good. And then it cut off at half. Like he is going to give them fifteen hundred pound. Then realize fifteen hundred pound at once would be a great amount of money. Probably at that time, yeah, that should be. And then he decided to give them yearly hundred pound. But still, his wife was not happy because that's an annuity. Like every year, pay is a, like direct debits. Every time it's going on and on. Sometimes you could not have enough money to pay them. Yeah, that's true at some point. But yet, those money is not yours. This is your father's money, and you were using this money to income to earn more 
but still you are not happy to give them away to your doll or i mean to your sisters even though they are half sisters in the first place you have your share plenty of them so why not you agree to that okay the complex started here let's go further okay to be sure it will indeed to say the truth i am convinced within myself that your father had no idea of your giving them any money at all the assistance he thought of i dare say was only such as might be responsibly expected to you for instance such a such as looking out for a comfortable small house for them, helping them to move their hard things, and sending them presents of fish and game and so forth whenever they are in season. I will lay my life that he meant nothing further indeed. Sorry, I will lay my life that he meant nothing further indeed. It would be very strange and unreasonable if he did. Do, but consider, my dear Mr. Dashwood, how excessively comfortable your mother-in-law and her daughters may live on the interest of seven thousand pounds besides that thousand pounds belonging to each of the girls, which brings them in fifty pounds a year apiece, and, of course, they will pay their mother for their board out of it. Altogether, they will have 500 a year amongst them. And what on earth can four women want for more than that? They will live so cheap. Their housekeeping will be nothing at all. They will have no carriage, no horses, and hardly any servants. They will keep no company and can have no of any kind only conceive how comfortably they will be 500 a year i'm sure i cannot imagine how they will spend half of it and as to your giving them more it is quite absurd to think of it they will be much more able to give you something i mean really Okay, upon my word, said Mr. Dashwood, I believe you are perfectly right. My father certainly could mean nothing more by his respect to me than what you say. I clearly understand it now, and I will strictly fulfill my engagement by such acts of assistance and kindness to them as you have described. When my mother removes and into another house, my services shall be readily given to accommodate her as far as I can. Some little present of furniture too may be acceptable then. Certainly, returned Mrs. John Dashwood, but however, one thing must be considered. When your father and mother moved to Norland, though the furniture of Stanhill was sold, all the china plate and linen was saved and is now left to your mother her house will therefore be almost completely fitted upon as soon as she takes it this is a material consideration undoubtedly a valuable legacy indeed and yet some of the plate would have been a very pleasant addition to our own stock here yes and the set of breakfast china is twice as handsome as what it belongs to this house a great deal too handsome in my opinion for any place they can ever afford to live in but however so it is your father thought only to only of them and i must say this that you owe no particular gratitude to him nor attention to his wishes for we very well know that if he could he would have left almost everything in the world to them this argument was irresistible it gave to his attention intentions 
whatever of decisions was wanting before, and he finally resolved that it would be absolutely unnecessary, if not highly indecorous, to do more for the widow and the children of his father than such kind of neighborly act as his own wife pointed out. So, truth to be told, uh, his wife is not a good humane person. She does not want to give anything to the deceased wife and daughter. And he, she convinced uh, his, uh, her husband that he should not obey his father's last wishes to saying that if his father was alive, his father would have wanted to give everything to the daughters and his wife, which is, um, I don't know, true or false, but it's so uh, sociable. You can see in our society, in the society or decorum in our Bangladeshi society, almost all the sons think the same. Almost. I'm not saying that all the sons will think the same, but um almost all of them and they are actually convinced mostly by their wives but the wives always forget that she was the daughter of someone as well if her father or her mother or her brother would have done the same thing to her how would she had I mean, how felt that, I mean, how she could have been even dealt with it. So we should be considerable. We should be maybe not respecting someone's last wishes because everybody is dying. So last wishes, there is actually nothing to be told. They are probably uh, in between the time of life and death so they are dying so their dying wishes actually carries almost no values but still it's it's a wish and it's the thing it's the last words you have heard it's the last thing they have said so that would be like the rock solid things that memory should have been engraved on your brain so you should respect it at, at any point it's not like that even not in the dying people if you promise someone something try to keep it because promises means a lot it's not it is not something you can break so easily you can actually uh, look around it you cannot if you promise something please do it if you can't do it don't promise it and um, I was not feeling very very well but when I read it I'm feeling really alive again so I'm finished this is the end of sub chapter 2 I hope you like the video as well and enjoy and encourage me to go for the chapter 3 and whenever I feel I have time I will definitely post chapter 3 and you will continue reading it take care till then good night